So in keeping with this notion of multiple perspectives, uh, we thought we would fill out the day um, hearing from the Department of Energy and the Research and Technology Group on the advisory side that's going on in that portion. And we have uh, Chris Smith, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fossil Energy, but he's in charge of oil and gas. Uh, he's also the industry co-chair or the government co-chair on the National Petroleum Council study that's looking at domestic resources. We have Dr. Uh, Charlie Williams. Uh, Charlie is the Chief Technology Officer at Shell and he deals with uh, deep uh, water well design and containment, but for purposes today he will talk about the Joint Industry Task Force and the safety group that he leads in that Joint Industry Task Force and all the developments that have occurred um, over the last 10 or 11 months, uh, which have been substantial. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Mike Wallace is with us, and we asked Mike. Mike has recently joined CSIS as a senior advisor. Uh, Mike's the former COO of uh, Constellation, and he was head of the Constellation Nuclear Group. He was there at the creation of INPO, um, the nuclear uh, safety and regulatory group um, that kind of sets peer review and, and standards for the industry. And while it was painful, there's some useful lessons to learn. So it may not be the appropriate model, but we asked him to come by and just give his perspective on how that happened, what occurred, how companies stepped up, and how it evolved, and how long it took to actually get there. And then, of course, uh, Robin West, many of you know, Robin is the, the chairman and founder of PFC Energy. Um, he's also chairman now of the Institute of Peace, Institute for Peace. Um, he was an assistant secretary at the Interior Department and Oil and Gas and leasing activities were under his purview, so he's got a very different perspective as well. And we hope to continue that dialogue and discussion. For those of you that are looking for uh, Michael Bromwich's prepared remarks, we will have them posted on our website, hopefully within the next couple hours. Um, it was a long and detailed presentation, as Michael has wanted to do, but there's a lot of good information in there, so we want to make sure that that's available. So without further ado, um, further bios are in your handouts, but uh, let me welcome to the podium Chris Smith. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. So how do I control you. this Just here? Bring yourself. Assume this is me. And then lower left. There you go. All right. <coughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, Frank, for that uh, that kind introduction. Um, and I want to thank, for, thank you for the opportunity to come and, and speak to this group. Um, I've gotten to know Frank through our work with the, uh, the National Petroleum Council, so I've, uh, I've enjoyed working with you and your, uh, your experience. You understand how some of these, uh, these pieces fit together. Um, today I'm, I'm going to give you kind of a, a broad overview of some of the things that we're thinking about within the Department of Energy. Uh, our piece in this uh, complicated equation uh, I'll, I'll talk to you from a couple of uh, perspectives. Uh, first of all, I was the designated federal official for the, uh, the commission that was created by the president by executive order to look at the root causes of the BP, uh, BP Deepwater Horizon uh, disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. And secondly, um, I'm just coming yesterday from the first meeting of the Ocean Energy Safety Committee, uh, which I sit on with, uh, with uh, Mr. Charlie Williams, who's going to be speaking today. Um, looking forward, that's going to be an organization that's going to uh, truly help us to look at how uh, we're going to take the immediate steps that have been taken by the Department of, in of uh, Interior to ensure that the appropriate uh, mechanisms, mechanisms are in place from a regulatory standpoint and augment that with the type of research and, and science that needs to be conducted to ensure that we understand the risks and that we're putting in place mechanisms to uh, mitigate them appro appropriately. So my, uh, you know, my, my, my personal background, I, I spent a, a short time as, a, as an Army officer and spent uh, a number of years before coming into this role uh, working for oil and gas companies. So um, I have an appreciation for people who do difficult and, and, and dangerous work. And the, the folks who uh, supply the energy for our nation, for our economy, are certainly fit into that, into that category. So as we went through the, the look back of uh, trying to understand the root causes of the Deepwater Horizon and put in place uh, research and development and uh, regulation to ensure it doesn't happen again. Uh, we certainly had as a motivator the, uh, the 11 individuals who lost their lives back uh, on April 20th of 2010, uh, a year ago now. So that's informed much of the work that we've done. Uh, and. Uh, you know, not only are we dedicated to making sure that we've, we're producing the energy that we need for our economy, 
uh, but also making sure that we do it in a, in a way that's, uh, that's safe and sustainable. So I, I'm going to talk just very briefly through some of what we observed as being some of the root causes. These are uh, observations that inform the work that we do within the Department of Energy uh, that we will bring to the Ocean um, Energy Safety Committee as that group uh, considers the work it needs to do going forward. So in, uh, in just very high level terms, you, you've got a, a, a number of balancing acts that you're trying to, to manage in order to uh, drill difficult wells in a way that's, that's safe. Uh, first, you have this simple, the, the, the simplest level of keeping the well under control is this balance between hydro, hydrostatic pressure and, and formation pressure, which uh, essentially means that you, you've got, you know, in, in the case of Deepwater Horizon, this rig that's floating in a mile of water, uh, there's a mile between the, the rig and the 5,000 feet beneath where the, you're at the, the mud line, and beneath that another four miles down to the pay, to the, uh, the, the pay zone. And essentially through the drilling process, uh, you've got this five miles of fluid that's in this column that's in the, the well casing, uh, and the weight of that fluid has to be sufficient to counteract the force of uh, hydrocarbons trying to force away into the, into the well bore and get to the surface. Uh, that, in simplest terms, is uh, the, the first equation that you're trying to manage when you are uh, keeping the well under control. The second issue that was particularly important in this well uh, was this issue of pore pressure versus fracture gradient, which in, in simple terms is, is stating that you have to have enough weight, enough force in that, in that column of fluid to keep the formation under control, but not so much that you fracture the formation and you can create alternate pathways for hydrocarbons to f flow uncontrolled up to the surface somewhere outside of the casing and the, and the well bore. So this was um, uh, a challenge that uh, existed in this particular well and that exists when you're drilling difficult, well, difficult wells. Uh, this is just a, you know, a cartoon schematic of the, 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 uh, the drill bit as it passes through the, uh, through the formation. But as, essentially as you're, as you're drilling the well, you're constantly flowing uh, drilling mud down through that drill pipe, it circulates and comes back up the casing to the surface. Uh, you know how much fluid you're putting into the well, and therefore you know how much fluid you should be getting out. And if you're getting back out less than you're putting in, you suspect that you're uh, at some point along this, uh, uh, in your open hole, you're, 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 you're fracturing the formation. So this is something that occurred early on in this drilling process. Uh, it was something that informed all of the steps that, uh, that the, the companies took when they were drilling uh, the well eventually led to uh, the, 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 the accident. And as Secretary Chu and Secretary Salazar and, uh, and BP and all the other participants in the industry who were uh, helping us to, to resolve the crisis noted, uh, every step along the way when you're looking at different ways of capping the well, you're always concerned about this, this equation that you didn't want to make this situation worse. Uh, this is something that was resolved successfully in this case, but as was noted by Director Bromwich, as you go into more and more difficult situations and you get different challenges, uh, this is a, a, a moving target that you have to make sure that you, on an ongoing basis, understand the different types of risks that you have to deal with. Um, the third is this issue of data versus intuition, and this is something that the, uh, the committee yesterday spent some time talking about. You've got what you could consider the, you know, the, the technology, the hard science of understanding how uh, fluid passes through porous media, how fractures propagate, um, all of those things that technically you need to understand to drill a well safely. But you also have this, this uh, concern about human factors engineering, about how you take decision makers on the platform and allow them to make in real time uh, important decisions that are going to lead to your ability to control the well and keep uh, drilling safely. This is just a, a, a picture of the last two hours of the Sunsbury uh, data, which is measuring a number, number of things, you know, pressure and, and, and flow rates. It, you, you, you can't read this from where you're sitting, and that's it's kind, of, kind of the point. I mean, this is, this is actually uh, a you know, manifestation of the type of reading that the person on the platform has to read, follow, make decisions, and act upon those decisions in real time. Um, it was, for me, notable during the investigation itself when the lead counsel was up talking through the, uh, 
the investigation that they had, they had conducted. They, they took this diagram, they took this graphic, they, they blew it up, they cropped it, they spun it, they put arrows on it, so that you could see bits of key information that's hidden in this readout. There was uh, one point in particular where they noted that this was you know, one of the first tangible signs of a potential blowout where they had a slight increase in pressure on the drill pipe at a time in which the pump rate was steady. And in that condition, you would expect a, a more steady uh, pressure reading. And there was a slight increase, which is uh, captured here in, 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 in one of these arrows. But that is something that that individual who's on the platform, who's responsible for ensuring that the drilling is done safely, would have to see and note, interpret, and act upon in real time. Uh, if we look at the way that other systems operate you know, outside the oil and gas industry, be it the, the nuclear navy or the way we manage uh, uh, nuclear reactors or the way that we handle air, uh, air traffic control in, in congested airports, uh, similarly, you're dealing with tremendously complicated uh, quantities of data, and you're having to take that information, you're having to push it into uh, something that an operator, a skilled and conscientious operator, but, you know, a human being, has to be able to make decisions on. Uh, this isn't something that's unique to the Deepwater Horizon. I mean, this is the way that we, that we do things in, in, in oil and gas, and this is an area of research that I think that we can benefit from, from other areas that have to deal with complex and dynamic systems. And the, the last thing I'll mention is uh, the, the fail-safe barrier, which uh, was touched upon just briefly in the, in the last presentation. Um, we're still looking at uh, various studies that have looked at what actually happened with the BOP itself, the blowout preventer. Uh, the blowout preventer was considered to be that, that your, your fail-safe device. In this case, it, it appears that uh, during the blowout, just the force of those hydrocarbons coming up the well bore was sufficient that it was able to elastically buckle the drill pipe such that it, it physically was not located within the cutting surface of the blind shear ram, which was supposed to cut that pipe and crimp it. it was, the, the BOP appears to have operated, right? the, the devices that were supposed to close on the, on the drill pipe closed. But the range of failure in which it had been previously tested wasn't uh, was not sufficient to predict that it needed to operate in a, an environment that was, was, was this extreme. Again, th this was not a condition that was unique to this particular drilling rig or this particular drilling crew. Um, this was the blowout preventer that was uh, the, the, uh, the same type that's being, that's been used in, in, in other operations. So again, uh, this is another area of, of interest that uh, is being addressed by the Department of, of the Interior and, and their regulatory standards, and that uh, we will continue to look at as we go out into uh, deeper horizons, as we go and look for oil and gas in, in, more, in more difficult locations. So th th this is a, a, a one of the conclusions of the, the Oil Spill Commission. And again, the Oil Spill Commission was an independent, bipartisan organization that looked at root causes. And uh, you know, one, of, one of their conclusions was the immediate causes of the Macondo well blowout can be traced to a series of identifiable mistakes made by BP, Halliburton, and Transocean uh, that reveal such systematic failures in risk management that they place in doubt the safety culture of the entire industry. Um, there's, there have been some observers that have taken this quote and looked at this as a, as a strong statement. But when, when you really think about it, when you, when you think about the commonality between the operation as it existed on that platform, and there were mistakes were made, and there were, there were, there were problems, obviously, with that, with that particular operation. But there are many things, I think, we can identify uh, that we have to address uh, that are common. And the idea that we can focus very narrowly on one event, that we can relive that disaster and refight that battle and figure out how to deal with that specific incident and just move on and change nothing else is, is not the approach that we've taken. So that's a, a philosophy that's, that has informed the, uh, the work that's been taken by uh, the Department of Interior to make sure that they reform their regulatory environment and ensure that this doesn't happen again. And it's a spirit that informs the research that we're doing within the Department of Energy to make sure that we're not 
going back and refighting the old battle, but we're looking at new things that have to be uh, considered uh, as we move out into to more difficult frontiers. Um, we've had uh, a collaborative relationship uh, between the Department of Energy and the other uh, agencies that, that, uh, that, that, that operate in this space. Um, I won't uh, elaborate too much on the, the points here that, that uh, uh, Director Bromwich uh, talked about in, in, in great detail, uh, but I will highlight a couple of uh, comments that the, uh, has been made by the President in terms of uh, our commitment to make sure that we get this, get this right. Um, the first was a, a quote made by the President that were during, actually during the disaster not too long after the well was blown out. Um, I continue to believe that domestic oil production is an important part of our overall strategy for energy security, uh, but I've always said that it must be done responsibly for the safety of our workers and the environment. Uh, that again was uh, during the time that Secretary Chu was down in the, the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico working with the teams to ensure that we, uh, uh, that we took care of the, uh, the problem. Um, and the second comes recently from the blueprint for America's energy future that, that, uh, that followed the President's energy speech in Georgetown uh, on the 30th of last month. Uh, when I was elected to this office, America imported 11 mil million barrels of oil a day. Uh, by a little more than a decade from now, we will have cut that by one third. That is something that, that we can achieve. Achieving that means that we have to get this, uh, 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 we have to get this right, uh, that we have to figure out how we can produce safely and move forward to, to commercialize this, this resource. Um, Director Bromwich gave you a, a couple of statistics about the progress that they've made in terms of changing the rules in the Gulf of Mexico to reflect uh, a mitigation of the risks as we see it, and their progress in uh, permitting wells as companies have made the steps and strides that they've asked for. So since the 28th of February, uh, 11 deep water, deep water wells and over 49 shallow water wells in, in that, in that uh, period of time since, uh, since last summer. So certainly this is something that, that we do have to solve. Uh, we have to do this. If you look at the places where new reserves are coming from, they're coming from the ultra deep water and they're coming from unconventional plays onshore. Uh, these are new frontiers in terms of opportunities, but they're also areas in which uh, we have to bring our understanding and our scientific uh, ability to, to quantify risks to bear. So those are the, uh, those are the comments that I had, Frank. I, I think I'll do we pass it on to the next uh, speaker, and then we'll take questions at the end. Yes. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I was going to talk about the industry response to uh, post Macondo, and, and I was going to talk about the things that were proactively done in the industry following the Macondo incident and how those uh, have uh, contributed to uh, cooperation and, and communication and working you know, with the government agencies and, and the different investigative bodies that have uh, looked into Macondo as, as we evolve this. And so the things I'm going to talk about are the uh, four industry task forces that were set up immediately after Macondo, subsea containment, which you know, was mentioned uh, uh, by uh, D Director Bromwich and others, well design, and then the Center for Offshore Safety. And so, you know, I get asked a lot, uh, so what's changed uh, post Macondo? And of course, I, you know, I, I'm tempted to put up one view graph and say everything, and then, you know, I, I, I'm uh, done with my talk. And, uh, but, and, and, and in lots of ways, you know, it is everything. I mean, there's been you know, a lot of, you know, very good, positive, uh, constructive uh, changes. But certainly there were a lot of good things, good standards, uh, good processes going on uh, before Macondo. And, and a lot of those have been enhanced and, and improved uh, post Macondo. So, um, you know, in a way it's everything, in, in a, but, you know, lots of other good things were going on. But the key thing I wanted to talk about is, so the other thing I get asked is, uh, you know, when's it going to be normal again? 
and uh, and Director Bromwich you know, also talked about this. But I mean, the the truth is, of course, it's never been normal. Uh, it's never been normal in the regard that the the entire industry has been faced with um, increasing technical challenges, you know, deeper water, uh, Arctic, more remote operations. Uh, deeper reservoirs, more difficult reservoirs. So we've had to evolve the technology on a continuing basis, uh, you know, for, you know it, 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 through the, out the entire history of the industry. So actually, you know, in a way, you could say it's never been normal because we've always had to evolve things. Now, the other thing, of course, we, we evolve is the safety system, safety processes, environmental protections. And I think that, you know, the, of course, the key in all of this is to evolve these in an appropriate manner and evolve these at the right speed uh, together. You know, you have to evolve.